morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yogesh, and thanks, Dr. Arunda, for wanting to be in this good clinical practice. It's certificate courses that you have to be here almost now for 18 years, I guess, but the reason why the second certificate was the people have always been especially in relation to quality control. So, how's everyone today? Thanks. So, would it not have been better if Rogesh had announced a tea break instead of a bio break? <laughs> <laughs> so, just to move on, how many of you have actually worked in molecular labs? Yeah, so there are a few of you who have already worked, so this will be a revision for you. And for those who have, am I clearing up with this mask? Yes. And for those of us who have not worked, this will be like a teacher teaching in school, can I request professor emeritus now to have the coding here. That's how it usually serves. So, what is molecular diagnosis used for? Now, with COVID 19, all of us know. Even patients come and tell me, RT PCR karna hai. Those who are intelligent patients can RT PCR nahi chahiye, right chahiye. So, they know the importance of kind of molecular diagnosis today. The world is aware of molecular diagnosis. So, COVID 19 was responsible for that. So, basically, I'm going to be uh, dealing with perspectives in relation to infectious disease. I'm from microbiology. Okay, so I'm not going to be covering everything else. Probably many of you what I worked in genetic lab, forensic sciences lab. So that's not what it's going to be. So all kinds of examples will be related to infectious diseases. So we know that it can be used for detecting infectious diseases. The commonest examples or the most common examples is a very popular. I must have heard of gene export, which is used for TB, like COVID-19 antigen. So these are just a few examples. Then babies that are born through HIV positive mothers, we know what is called as an early infant diagnosis, and that's also based on PCR. So that's about diagnosing a particular disease, right? And there are certain diseases where it is required to monitor if the patient is responding to treatment or if the patient is worsening who has been put on treatment. So the classical example of that is HIV viral load. So HIV viral load is Used for disease monitoring, it is used for disease progression, it is used for clinical response to antiretroviral therapy that is being deal with. Then the third classical example that I can tell you in relation to microbiology is detection of mutations. How many have heard of this expert MTB? This gene expert, how many of you are using? So, madam, you know that you get a result which is infanticide resistance detected. So, specific mutations responsible either for the genetic abnormalities or for determining the resistance of an organism to a particular anti, uh, antibiotic. In case of TB, we have infanticide. So, that is also something that can be done using molecular diagnosis. And of course, in forensic medicine. I don't know. I can't relate to you because I'm much, much older. So, I have seen some Sunil Shetty movies where he says, Mere Dolo Bab, thanks. So, you can't have two Babs, so you need to find out which one is the true biological father, so that's also something that is done. So, forensic medicine, so multiple branches that use this technology today to try to know the essential thing and that is detection. So, infectious diseases, what is its role? Do I have to do it for every single organism? Like, for example, you have heard of Staphylococcus, maybe you have heard of cholera, you have heard of typhoid. So, is it necessary to do it for everything? Is it necessary to do it on all samples? Probably not. So, this introduction of mine before going into the good clinical laboratory practice is going to be a little longer than usual introductions. So, it cannot, it, it is mainly done for organisms that cannot be seen by microscope. Microscope is the fastest technique that we have. If you see it, it is there, if you don't see it, it is not there. So, like for example, TB. So, you can see it under the microscope, but for that, you need a whole lot of organisms to be filled with, right? Whereas, when you do a molecular technique like PCR, you need very little organisms and it can detect those organisms. So, it cannot be detected by microscopy, it cannot be detected by culture. All of the detection is equally important for isolating the patient, for contact tracing. That's how we started up with the artificial of COVID 19 because it was spreading very fast. So, all these are the reasons why we go use a molecular test in microbiology. So, let's understand what molecular technique is an example that I have taken, and that is PCR. So, let's understand a little bit about PCR. It's a three step process. Who's this? Why do 
So if, if, if I had just shown the forehead, would it be possible to recognize maybe with a curly hair, right? Correct. If I had just shown you the chin, would you have recognized maybe not? Many chins look the same. But I think this characteristic smart of uh, such a trigger, which is so very characteristic that you know, okay, this is the chin, right? So what is that we hope simply is when we talk about molecular diagnosis and detecting a pathogen, what we are looking for is something very, very unique for that organism, which is not present in any other organism, right? You have multiple type of umbrellas as a single yellow umbrella, which can be easily recognized. The same thing as such in spine. So this is called as the target. So you can apply molecular detection tools only to those organisms which have unique nucleotide sequences, which are not present in any other organism and can differentiate this organism from all others. So if an organism does not have that, you can't use a molecular tool. It's as simple as that. So PCR is nothing but an amplification of that target sequence millions of times, right? So the basic, these are the individuals who should be credited for PCR, which is being increasingly huge and has brought about a sea change in the way we do diagnosis today. Therapy Malik is the one who was awarded the Nobel Prize for the same. So the basics of PCR is that there are three processes here. First is you have to denature the DNA, double standard to single standard. What do we want? Multiple million copies, right? So you have to make multiple copies of the single standard DNA of the original template, right? So that is achieved by what is called an I mean, a small bit of sequence to both the ends. One is the three dash to five dash and the other is the five dash to three dash end, and then allow it to extend. So you have three steps. The first is de denaturation. The second is annealing of the fragment which will extend to the length that it wants to extend and the third is extending the same. So at the end of 40 cycles, you will have to print to the power of nine copies. That's how it has got an exquisite sensitivity, right? Compared to even microscopy, and technically compared to even culture. So one target sequence gets multiplied manifold for about 10 to the power of nine target sequences at the end of 40 thermal cycle uh, process. So what do I, if, if I have to do the PCR, why is this uh, uh, information important? Because if you are setting up a molecular diagnosis lab, every single step in the process is important for controlling, okay? So we have multiple steps and multiple needs in a PCR laboratory. First is, I should have an organism where the target is identified. If the target is not identified, I cannot use a molecular diagnostic tool. Then for annealing, you need a set of specific parameters. Correct? Now that has to extend. How will it extend? You have to provide the nucleotides. So we use ATGC nucleotides. Then we need for COVID PCR. What is it called? RT PCR. Right? Can somebody tell me what does RT stand for? Real time. Real time. When you want to say real time, it's Trota R. So when it's capital R, it is reverse transcriptase. That means that it converts an RNA into a DNA. Right? So basically, most uh, PCR reactions work as a DNA only. So the RNA gets converted into complementary DNA. So we are going to talk about a uh, virus, which is an RNA virus, which is something in the nature called as reverse transcriptase to convert it into a DNA. Then we said that there has to be an extension. How will things get extended? You need to have polymerase. So the one that is most commonly used is a top polymerase, okay? Thermos of particles is the basis from which the top polymerase is there is synthesized. Then, of course, you need to use multiple reaction mixtures, which mainly consists of iron, saturation, magnesium. Then, you need to have, especially molecular labs, you can't do with distilled water, DNA, and so on, to have a molecular gray water. A molecular gray water is one which will be nucleate free. Why do you know not be nucleases? Because they will destroy your nucleic acid, which are trying to detect. So, you need to have nucleate free water. And then, you need to have a thermal cycle. So, this can be a conventional thermal cycle. Or it can be a real time PCR system. There is also a new technique which is called as isothermal amplification. So you don't need these thermal cycles, but that is not a part of today's system. So then you have to detect. So you have used all these things, you have renatured, you have annealed, and you have also extended. 
multiple cycles have happened, there are n number of copies. So now you have to do what is called as post amplification. So detection by post amplification could be done in real electrophoresis or it can be done using the real time PCR machine where you don't have to run the gel. So in real time, if it is getting amplified, it comes in the amplification clock. So you see multiple clocks. So if those clocks are present, amplification has happened. If the clocks are not present, amplification has not happened. So that's the basic principle of the clock. You must have heard about I had multiple sessions on quality control, right? Why so I'm not much more of an expert than probably I ever was. So when you know that there is a lot of quality that is involved, because it's about quality control, this whole CMO workshop is about quality control, quality control is about quality control. So we need to have a quality at every step of the process. So the flow of processes in a PCR laboratory will be simple, right? First is you have to accept samples. So do you think there is a quality control department there? Yes. So can someone give me an example? Excellent. If I exit the time, I will stop. You can go through the presentation and any time later easier. Okay. Yes. Acceptance and rejection criteria. Yeah. Yes. So you have certain acceptance and rejection criteria. So if you fit into the rejection criteria, you don't want to take it because if you take it, you will either get a cause or the or cause negative result, right? And acceptance criteria, if you test it, you probably will get a more accurate result. Suppose you have a sample that is leaking, and there are two, three samples in the same pouch. One leaking sample can contaminate the other samples that were there because you will be handling every single of those things. It is true that you can go away with the gloves, wear new gloves, but all those things in reality and in practicality has never worked totally. It would work technically, theoretically, but it doesn't work. So if you get such samples, leaking samples are never accepted for PCR. Then sample aliquotic for extraction. All of you must have used pipettes, right? How many of you know that why pipettic aerosols are created? Did CR might have demonstrated it yesterday? Dr. CR, the body in bio safety, because it, it creates aerosols to the extent of 10 to the power of 6 particles. So every pipetic act can generate aerosols. So while your aliquotic sample means you're taking the sample and putting it in another view for processing. So if you're not careful about the way you use the pipette, the pipette kit, then you are going to get the aerosol which is going to contaminate the next sample. Because we have this habit of wrapping with batches. So what are the things that we need to look at? What are the limiting, limiting factors in molecular diagnosis? The first limiting factor is contamination. At each single step of the process, there is a chance or risk of contamination always. So there has to be contamination control. If we don't have contamination controls, then what result can we get? Negative. All the right? So 
And if you have a PCR center, then you do not know whether things are happening properly. What is the reputation there? False negative. So you can both have a situation where you have false positives. You can have a situation where you have false negative. So the basic measures should ensure there's nothing that can ensure may ensure is a push should ensure that there is elimination of contamination, should ensure that there is no prevention or no nothing that is preventing the amplification, and it should ensure that there is multiple quality checks at each flow or level or step of the PCR cycle until you detect. So from spark sample acceptance to detection everywhere if you have some kind of a quality. So what are these? Uh, I go back on Dr. Shri Yad's lecture yesterday. So we should have good knowledge and practice of laboratory biosecurity and research practices. We know how upset we were with personal protective equipment by circulating samples for COVID, testing samples. So all those things should be taken into consideration because in a in a in an infectious disease laboratory, you are dealing with hazardous pathogen. The hazard category could be risk level one, two, three, four, but there is a hazard with every single pathogen that you're dealing with. And therefore, you need to follow strict biosafety practices. And because you don't want to have contamination, your practices should be such that you don't introduce contamination, right? And that is called as aseptic practices. Then the laboratory layout. So we saw those many processes, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, from sample acceptance to detection. All those processes should ideally happen in separate, physically separated areas that are well separated. They should cannot have well separated so many areas, there should at least be three areas or even just in the next slide. And the workflow. It is not like it does say Udar Chale, Udar say Udar Chale. It always has to be clean to turn it out. Or you have two, two sets of designated stuff. One who does the dirty, dirty kind of thing. It doesn't mean dirty, dirty means kachra, which technically that it's a more contaminated activity that we do, and the other who do the clean kind of an activity. So these two sets of, uh, uh, I would say, the body stuff should be separate. They can do it on different days at different times, but then they cannot run from the dirty lab to the clean lab ever. So this is true even for the consumer goods that you want to transfer. So each lab should have its own set of equipment, its own set of consumables. As far as possible, nothing should be shared between the clean area and the contaminated area. The equipment should be well calibrated, that's probably something that is already being covered. And in PCR lab, you need to, you need to run what I call as environmental controls. Environmental controls is not about the temperature, it's not just about the temperature, it's not just about the humidity, it's not just about the cleanliness, it's also about whether there is any contamination of amplicons there. But then because they get released in so many numbers. So you need to check for the presence of amplicons. So what will you do? If that be present or not, anybody who's working in the lab? Madhu? Anybody? Otherwise, in a routine lab, if you want to do something is contaminated, what will you do? Do a swap. The same thing you follow. Only thing is, the area is different, the equipment is different. Even the personal protective equipment when you are working, you can also check on that. So you need to take multiple samples of all the equipment at the beginning of all the surfaces that are being touched, right? By the working before work, after work, to solve them. You don't have to necessarily put one PCR reaction for all work. You can hold them. Right? You can hold them and then you find out, go back and find out whether any of those work contaminated. This is an activity that should be done periodically, but regularly. So we kind of do it once a month in our last because there is not much of a contamination, but if you face much of a problem. And you are forced to do a decontamination routine, then you must do it following that. And check that the measures are worked. And standard operating procedures, you can see that it becomes like a please okay to try to be kya kya okay that may document control, standard operating procedures, equipment calculated, bring person, or that is this is a general layout of a PCR lab, it could be better. But we should have at least three areas. Clean means no contamination there. So that's a reagent preparation area where you're making the master mix, right? Nothing should get into it. 
So that is the cleaning stage of the figure. Then you can have a right of preserving the specimen, accepting the specimens where the nucleic acid is being extracted. So that can be the second area. And the PCR area has to be separate. Please. Thermal cycling, whether real time or conventional, has to be kept separately. So, minimally, I would suggest we will do work with two areas. I'm not saying no, but I think they are extremely desperate and extremely intelligent. But for a normal individual like me, I would like to have at least three areas for these three different activities where the movement always has to be from somebody to contrast. Never the other way around. So, in terms of specimen collection, are there any unique characteristics that is required when we are thinking of PCR? Yes. But the device should be made of an inert material. Anything that is to do with index, infectious diseases or any for that reaction, uh, reactors for that matter, has to be clean and sterile. So, for a molecular setting, it is extremely essential that the container is clean and sterile and made of inert material. Some connection devices are not recommended at all because they might inhibit the PCR reaction and this includes the dividend and formalism. Okay, there are certain things uh, that are recommended, right? Sy synthetic swabs. If you have used medium ever for connection, then you know that the swabs that come with medium are synthetic swabs, right? So you use synthetic swabs, you don't use swabs made of cotton because some authors say that cotton can be used to for inhibition of the PCR amplification. Dry blood sperm can be taken and blood, if you want to do, preferably use EDTA blush. Then separate out the blood sperm. This is especially true for viral infection. So EDTA blood is one recommended for viral pathogen. Otherwise, you can use the whole sample without adding common. You don't necessarily have to have a preservative. Then if test requires plasma, then it's important to test for that. If there is going to be a delay in testing of beyond 48 hours, store the plasma as a minus 70, no question about it. Right, so there are no two ways. So if you're setting up a PCR lab, you need to have the right kind of equipment. If you don't have the right kind of equipment, wait until you get the right kind of equipment to test the PCR. So what are the storage conditions that are possible? Almost all samples can be stored for 24 degrees Celsius at 4 degrees. I mean, uh, for 24 hours at 4 degrees Celsius. Beyond that, if you want to have storage, then you depend upon what is the target nucleic acid that you are detecting here, whether it is DNA based or RNA based. An RNA based assay should necessarily go into minus 7 to minus 80, and a DNA based assay sample or the element that you get can go at minus 20. Is that true? <laughs> so, you should know the storage conditions of not just the nucleic uh, acids or the samples that we are talking about, but also the reagents that we use. An RT PCR kit, right, which is used for amplification, so should go at minus 20. Whereas the consumables that you get all plastic present so that. So, but the samples, if there is not going to be a delay of 24 hours, can be stored always at 4. 4 put it at 0. Nothing goes at 0. Either it goes to 4 or it goes to minus 20 or it goes to minus 70. These are only the three numbers that we need to know. No other number in terms of storage as far as PCR. So, this is basically the area that we have. That is a specimen processing plant and there is a no template plant. What is the template? Anybody, what is the template? The nucleic acid, the nucleic acid that we have extracted from the sample becomes the template. So I will leave this slide to a little problem slide and take a long time to explain. But the basic thing is there should be two different things: for designated equipment, manpower, consumables, reagents, etc., etc. So yes, any consumable needs to be moved from one area to the other. I'm talking about those two areas. You fell short of same type plates. Okay. So now those pyrotechnics are being used to the extraction tool. And there are no pyrotechnics to run the PCR or to add the master, prepare the master. Book. What will you do? You have to take it from this lab. You cannot say I do it tomorrow. Clean it. Right. So you have to, you know, rather than using the term, I know that even generally people use the term clean, but the word to be used here is decontaminate. Right? So you need to decontaminate the tobacco covers because if not open the tobacco, there is that box. So to decontaminate the preservative versus alcohol. And then set it across. And if you don't have that 70% isopropyl alcohol, maybe you can use one person to the same. So the crux of a good practice in a molecular diagnosis memorandum is almost always, as it ever will be, forever be, a dimension. Question. 
This is what you do every day, but at the end of the day, it might be different. If you can do it very hard, you can still add, you can finish your work, you can hand it to some more, make sure you come and spread it. So, when you will be said that's not allowed. It has to be fresh, it has to be clean on every single day. And you cannot move with the same back toe of that blouse from one side to the other. If you are forced to move from a dirty to a clean area, you can change everything and go with a fresh head on. Like not the same. Then also, I would tell people who they work, if there is a policy in the lab, after every 10 samples, irrespective of any medical contamination, you change the layer of blouse. But that doesn't always work in a busy lab, right? You don't have the time, etc. etc. But at least when you see visible contamination, stop, pause, remove, change it to a new one, and then you proceed. Just don't proceed like that to the then everything that you want to use in the labs should be done carefully. And they should always be true. When I'm preparing a master next, or when I'm adding a template to the plate of uh, master next, we will take everything and we should not have the uh, effect of two groups. We should have prepared the master next. So keep it there. Don't keep it open. Or shift it from one lab to the other. Open it when you have a good group. Add it to the Right? And where possible, use positive displacement pipe. Do you have positive displacement pipe in your no labs? So that does not generate so much of a negative pressure. It's under positive pressure all the time. So there is no reason why I don't take it from you. So this is just an example of how a micro needs to be used. What kind of fiber fiber tips do you use now? Barrier. Right? So, there is a word for that barrier. So, these two sizes tell us why, what is the importance of a barrier. So, this is a situation where there is no barrier. You have the first sample. You have to take out the sample and add it to something. Right? So, while you are aspirating, you can see that some amount of the specimens gets into this inner tube of the fiber. This is of the fiber, this is your ticket. So this is getting into the microbism, right? So when you discard this tip, the bigger is discarded. But this guy's portion still remains. So when you take the next sample and add it to the next variable, you are taking you are also adding this portion. So which means that you are carrying over the sample of the first and adding it to the sample of the second because we did not use the concept of barrier tips. When you use a barrier tip, it does not capture the whole here. So, what it gets into the fiber, and that's all the uh, additions are clean and without contamination. So, every PCR laboratory should necessarily do the thing that we have tips. Look, I don't know, some of us have people in our house who are extremely uh, obsessed with cleanliness. The same principle applies, just let them to go lab to see the lab is clean. That will solve a lot of problems. So, it's our always for senior to be able to change the lab is clean. I don't tell the reason that because our hands are pushed in, tell them what's clean and it does not touch our body, right? But if you take a senior person's experience of clinics because they're also doing this at home, that is how clean is the importance of the PCR lab. So, what is important also here to add the concept of what is called as ZAP. What is usually ZAP? ZAP. So, that, uh, that, what does it mean? Pulado. So, that's inactive, right? So, there are something called a nucleus, uh, nucleic acid zap solutions that remove whatever contaminant uh, uh, nucleic acids are left in the environment as contaminants. So, it could be on the surfaces, they could be on the environment, so they are left as contaminants. So, you need to remove them before you take up the next batch of zap So, if you're working with the biosafety cabinet, which is a must. Right, the services of the biosafety cabinet would be every time clean. Not just with sodium hypochlorite, not just with alcohol, but also use a DNA sap solution at the end of the day. Okay. Then the other thing that you can have in the lab is UV radiation. Now, how it works and what it does is very good, right? The only thing that I want us to remember as far as UV radiation is concerned is that the UV lights has to be clean for it to radiate. That you need to fit the whole nanometer, it will come only if it is clean. If it is coated with dust, actually, there is no 
there is nothing more important. Like I said, you need to have somebody employed who just looks at the money. Clean, 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 decontaminate, decontaminate, decontaminate. If you don't go to have a lab that is free of Amazon, that is free of Target, that way, for that nation. I told you how you should be using baby powders uh, on bleach. You should use water after 10 minutes. After that, you can use alcohol, or you should use Right, so in terms of quality control, what is it that we need to do? Right. Quality control, yeah, if you have a test, what is the quality control that you done? Positive control, negative control. So that comes with your kid. And if you are running a quantitative test, you have all those calculation questions. In addition, what do we need to run in a PCR lab? But no template control, right? So, no template control, there is no template that you just need to cover the place in So, you just add the uh, make a run the PCR on the master pick that you have prepared to put the master pick that you have done. What else should you have done? Have you heard of CV map for PCR? Have you heard of CV map for any other disease? CV map starts for carpet based motion cancer amplification test. So you need to have what is called as an internal control. Internal control needs to understand whether an extraction, because there are two steps, two major steps in PCR, right? One is extraction of the acid, the other one is amplification of that acid carbon sequence, right? So in these two steps, you need to know whether extraction has happened and whether amplification has happened. So you need to have what is called as an internal control. Your controls are even if the kit may work, but whether your extraction has happened properly. That you need to have a conclusion. So, most of the time, we use all of the human housekeeping deals. All of that great. So, you have what is called as a concept of human housekeeping deal, which becomes an integral part of the RD PCR assay itself that we provide. So, we do not procure an RD PCR assay that does not provide human housekeeping deal as an internal control. Many of the case provided with external uh, control, like at the time of extraction, you are amplification, you are actually no amplified. So, all added at the time of extraction, but they are not human. Why is it important to have human? Because it is a question that I have been Sorry, it's inherently pleasant. They have expressed all the time. And on the swab, you will have some human cells also, which will. Correct. So, if you become an extraction property, you probably take the How does it help or how does it does not help? Suppose I wanted to take this though, all the time, I will choose a table that does not have a human housekeeping gene, and I just said before. Have you understood what I did? It happens, man. Patients. Send samples without a swab, so we don't get the. No, they do send a swab, but they have never got collected the sample. Yeah, so you will never know whether the sample has actually been collected. They don't have to write in that. If you want to know whether the sample has actually been collected, you need to make it to the group itself or in the reaction itself the presence of a human housekeeping gene is masturbate for all human clinical specimens. Remember this, as you move towards PCR, start using things that have human control. Because many a time people want negative reports, so they don't send a sample, they do send a swab. I'm sorry, I didn't do it in this. They do send a swab, but the swab has not been collected. That is no evidence of an internal control. So, of it took place. So, in addition, you need to have an internal control. And I would also suggest that if you're beginning, when you, you need to also incorporate internal, previously uh, for tested positive control. That's a part of it. You see, you have external controls, you have internal controls. So that becomes a part of your life. You see, so you also run a positive. External controls, internal controls, and human. And they three for all the VCR reactions that like some authority pointed out or NPC, right? So all this will be there. So this is something that the whole of last two days you must have gone through for this accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, all the quality assessment program. Mandatory to participate in all these things that establish all this before. So, so what did we see when the limitations of a PCR lab that will hamper the test results? Two limitations. First one, it's a 
possibility of concatenation, right? Concatenation can be because of so the first major contaminant could be amplitude. And what is the other contaminant that we are looking at? It starts with a T. Ends with a T. Okay, so you have two major contaminants. So this particular instrument does away with all that. There is because you are loading one sample, so by the loading it inside and that's about the shutting. So it is shut it for it. So that there is no chance of contamination, either because of amplitude or because it is a closed system. There is no chance of contamination uh, because of private, because private uh, extraction takes place inside the number. So everything is a closed system. And therefore, it avoids the problem of contamination totally. Right? And it does not involve all those extraction activities. It's a fully automatic system. And that's why it becomes very popular. But the technique that inside this machine is called a CD lab. Right? So you have a CD lab now for CD, which is used by the program. And you have CD lab also for. So then this is a short exercise for you all. So don't take it much time. This is for the first two behind the two parts. So just interpret these test results. So this is your run. This is how the run will come. Then yes, each time there will be the name of the gene. So ORH stands for the gene of SARS-CoV. I see the internal control that I was speaking to you about, which is the human internal control, and N is the second gene of SARS-CoV. So then how do, you, how do you interpret the test? Whenever you get a test result, what is the first thing that you need to see for any test? Biochemistry, you know, pathology, you know, microbiology, you know, or it's microbiology, you know, what is the first thing that you will see? The controls so, are for The validity of the run by checking if the controls are appropriate. Right? So there is NTC there. What is expected in NTC? Negative. Nothing should amplify. Right? Because it's a no test rate control, nothing should amplify. So you don't have there. So, NBC is fine. Then we have loaded two positive controls. So, if the first positive control is the chip control, it does not provide by the internal control. So, both the genes should be detected. Are they being detected? PC, 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 jo likha hai, three rows below. It should be there. NBC ke against koi contamination nahi hai. PC ke against genes ke over amplification ka number is there. That's a cycle threshold, cheat value, cheat value, you go on to pull out of each code in the time, right? And the last one is the internal positive control that we choose to run. That it is still working. It's not just the heat control that's working, but the process is working. So that is also amplified. Because it's a incidentally tested positive, it will also show you IC. Now, can they, after this, we do interpret the test results? Can we interpret the test results? No, I don't want you to. So, is it okay to interpret the test results? Can I put it that way? Yes. When your controls have worked, NTC has worked, PC has worked, PPOC has worked, so I can interpret the test results. Unfortunately, all the samples are tested negative because there is only IC there. Understood? It's come over us. Follow the same approach to the NTC showing contamination with internal right? So even if you don't necessarily see the positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 genes in NTC, a contamination in any one of those genes is essential for us to negate the test run. Okay, so this test run is invalid and therefore I cannot take the limits of this test run. Clear? So look at the controls first, the three minimum controls that you should have is NTC, PC and PPC provided your uh, test as it includes the human housekeeping gene. So, what is so this is the concept of invariance that I spoke to you about. So, the spec there is no human housekeeping gene present in the sample, then you will have the sample that we need invariance, right? So, whenever the sample test invariant, you have to repeat the test most of the time, and when you repeat the test again, it turns out invariant. Because the first time there could have been some technical error, some equipment error, and because of which you guys have got an invalid result, the human internal control gene did not amplify. So, for every sample, I am looking for an amplification in IC. After the controls, I look for an amplification in IC. If the IC does not amplify, then I don't take the reading. IC need not amplify if it is positive. Because all the DNTPs have been used to amplify the positive, so the sometimes does not amplify, but the positive ones stop. 
But in the head example, I think it's random. So every man performs, I don't know, do you use such kinds of worksheets where you do the bunch of paper and write the and make the rest of the that you have tested and mark off the positive? So the same principle or the same methodology has been applied to a PCI that we have loaded so many examples in an automated machine. And as the red circle indicate follow this. What do you think? Yeah, so what you have to look at is usually, okay, so I can tell that we face this problem a lot during the first period, April, May 2020, but subsequently things improved, right? And we got automated systems into the picture. So when we get things that are so close to each other and they are positive, and there are all not in between that are negative, and then again, to have some positives, you just think that is there a possibility that there is something wrong here. I'm not saying that. Don't release the report until the register. So what did we do? We did and this was the Kingfisher. You can see that the extraction in it. Extraction is that you see the automated magnetic heat base extraction the machine that is used in the Kingfisher system. So this gave us the idea that it is not just the reagents and consumable that can get contaminated. Even the automated equipment that we have in the black can get contaminated. So, when the engineer was called for maintenance, he showed us he just brushed the thing with the tissue paper on the what you call as the foams, magnetic foams, and then when it be removed the tissue paper, the sample came up there. Other the things there. Okay, so don't look at every time the contamination is only here or only the way we do a thing, but it can also be related to the equipment. Go back, things redo, and when we retested, always everything was negative. Every single positive result came out to be negative. So that's the importance of the work that you do in our PCR lab. I don't think uh, you should be thinking of whether the sample run is positive, how many positives, how many negatives. Okay, look at is the sample run valid, and is there a chance of contact? So once you do that, that experiment becomes tough. So this is in short the summary of today's presentation, and I would like to set it more here to start reading on it. Behind you, behind you are already answered. So molecular assays to be done only when indicated, and they should be done very really carefully. Please, can you? There's only one point of the second row. Contamination and inhibition are additional parameters for which good practices. So, you have, you, have, you have learned about good practices in other laboratories. So, here we have to always be about contamination and inhibition, not getting really for the person that you are not giving. First, and you can have appropriate infrastructure, calibrated equipment, trained and proficient staff, good housekeeping, SOPs. So, by appropriate infrastructure, I think when you are physically separated areas, at least. Next, please. please choose the test platform by itself. So, can you tell me what I mean by this? So, if I if I'm using an RT PCR assay, then it will have a target in addition to the specific genes for that target for that organism. Right? The next one for the file safety. I think Dr. Sri Anita was an excellent talk yesterday, so I did not go into the details of this. The next one, please. Take appropriate specimens in appropriate. So, can you give me examples of new containers that should not be used? Parents should be used. Very good. Other one? That's an F. Not that you cannot do a PCR from formalin, but the chances of getting a formalin is with the run finishing. This is the last set. Next one, please. Storage conditions should be met at all. So, if I want to store something for only one day, what temperature? RT. Oh, oh, oh. If I want to store DNA for the number of cancer, what temperature? Next one, please. So, what are the that you need to go on? There should be an NTC, there should be an control, there should be an housekeeping sheet, there should be a negative control, there should be a concrete control. You can add on as many things for QC as you want. 